is uh, Karen Brisbane. I'm from the Golden Broken CMA. And welcome to Dealing with Aluminium in Your Soils, uh, our online workshop. Uh, we're recording today's session and Penny Stemp from Vic No Till. Thanks for hosting today's Penny from Vic No Till. Um, we'll be recording this session, so be mindful of when you're asking questions. Um, we have about 96 participants that will hopefully be joining us throughout the morning. So uh, it's a good, good show from across Australia participants. Uh, our two presenters today are David Hardwick, who is an Extol Soil Extension Officer. He'll be doing the bulk of the presentation today. And David Cook from Pine Lodge, who is a cropper and a Vic No-Till board member, will be giving his uh, take on aluminium and what he's done on his farm uh, over the years. Uh, we'd also like to thank the funders, the Commonwealth Government for helping us uh, put today on. <coughs> To contribute questions, please ask questions to the presenter via the chat box, which should be at the bottom of your section. There's a square box, which looks like a talking box. Put your questions in that, and we will facilitate questions at the end of David Hardwick's presentation. Uh, the morning session, so we've got David, will, David Hardwick will present for the first 50 to 60 minutes, depending on how we go time. And then David Cook will talk about uh, his experience on his farm with aluminium. Then we'll deal with questions uh, from participants and Penny and I will um, run through those questions and help address those to the appropriate person at the time. And from there, we'll also possibly have a question time, depending on how we go today and how many questions we get and whether we're able to answer everybody's questions. Uh, next Wednesday, the 10th of June at 1 p.m. And if you're interested in being part of this session after we've finished our presentation, can you put yes in the chat box uh, going forward? All right, Karen, um, I, myself and David will take ourselves off screen and mute ourselves and we'll pass it over to David. Do you want to share your screen and take it away? Thanks, Karen. Uh, welcome, everyone. Yeah, no, thanks for coming along. I'll just share my screen, so bear with me a minute. Uh, so hopefully everyone can uh, see the shared screen there. Uh, welcome to the to the webinar. Uh, thanks for giving up your Thursday morning. Uh, hopefully uh, doing a bit of heavy soil technical science on a Thursday morning won't make you choke on your Vegemite on toast. But uh, yeah, it's an important subject and aluminium can be a pretty big issue in some soils. So uh, hopefully today is helpful for you. Um, so I'm just getting my screen all organized. Okay, so I'm gonna jump straight in. Um, and today, what we're gonna cover in this webinar is we're gonna look obviously managing aluminium issues in your soil, if you have them in your soil. First of all, we're gonna look at why aluminium can be a problem, uh, the reason for that, and where aluminium comes from. Where actually, where does this whole problem start? So we're gonna go back to the beginning of where is aluminium and why does it get active? And to do that, we really have to explore a little bit. We have to go sort of back a few steps and cover a little bit of technical information, which hopefully I can do in a fairly user-friendly format uh, online. And that is we're gonna to have to explore the story of soil colloids, cations, uh, acidity, and exchangeable aluminium. So to get to the aluminium story, we really need to, um, have a look at these soil colloids and cations to get our head around exchangeable aluminium. Uh, and then we're going to look at acidity and exchangeable aluminium and why they muck around together, how come they're partners in crime. Uh, for the last two things we're gonna do is assess, learn how to assess the aluminium on your soil. Um, so learn how to read a soil test and then what are some of our options? And that's where David will come in talk about what he's done and we can explore a little bit the different ways that you can deal with uh, aluminium. As I'm going through the webinar this morning, I will stop from time to time to look at a soil test or a couple of different soil tests. So if you have a soil test and it's handy, feel free to follow along with your soil test. So you may be confident in reading your soil test or you may be sort of learning how to read it and not so confident, but um, I will take you step by step through how to look at aluminium on the soil test so that you can benchmark it and see if you have a problem and therefore have to spend money or effort to fix the problem. 
Um, I thought I'd just share that picture with you that you can see there. Uh, that's, there's a cane farmer. This is far north Queensland near Ingham. Uh, that's Michael Waring, and he's actually looking at a cover crop, a multi-species cover crop that the regenerative cane farmers up in North Queensland are, are growing these days. And you can see he's standing next to a crop of cane, and the reason I thought I'd throw that random shot in of a very different region to sort of southern Australia uh, is that up in North Queensland, uh, aluminium and acidity is a real problem. Tropical soils are really prone to it, uh, and in Sugar cane is a highly tolerant crop. A lot of tropical crops are actually quite tolerant of aluminium and you can grow cane reasonably well up to 50% aluminium. I thought it was just a good example to sort of show you that different uh, plants are actually have different tolerances to aluminium. We're going to come back to that later in the workshop. Uh, and also the other thing, the challenges the guys are having when they're starting to do regenerative cropping and multi-species cover cropping, etc., is that those, those varieties aren't as tolerant. So they're actually managing aluminium for their cover crops, not necessarily for their main cash crop. Um, so let's jump in and explore why aluminium is a problem for you if you've got it. And just a reminder that if you do have any burning questions, the chat box is open and punch them into chat and the guys can take care of them and hopefully we can cover them today or at the Q&A session uh, next Wednesday if we hold it at 1 p.m. Uh, so the key thing with aluminium or with soils is that your soil is an asset in your business. It's one of your farm business's most important capital assets. It's there 365 days of the year. You own it, you manage it, you're responsible for it. So what we say is it's part of your soil's natural capital. And this is a trial down uh, not far out of uh, northeast Victoria and the guys are doing an aeration trial to try and improve the soil asset so it grows more grass. You can see there the treatment on the right, they've really improved the condition of that asset. There's more roots, there's more structure, it's just gonna grow grass better. So that's their business asset basically and they're trying to improve it. And so you need to maintain your soil asset in good condition, you need to look after it. Uh, if it's gonna maintain productivity for you in the long term, unlike this vehicle here in the paddock, which is long time ago run down, you need to look after your soil asset. Uh, and if you do, a soil that's in good condition or uh, it carry out, carries key functions out for you, the first thing it does is it captures and stores water uh, really effectively. The second thing is it cycles your nutrients effectively or efficiently. Uh, it provides an optimum environment for plants to grow and stay healthy. Uh, and it minimizes soil borne diseases. So when a soil's in good condition, it does all of those things for you and that saves your costs or improves your productivity potential. Of course, often it does both. And the final thing, of course, is it actually helps the wider landscape. Topsoil's a key part of the landscape, it? and if they're healthy, well, everyone's happy, including the biodiversity, et cetera. Uh, and this is a paddock up in the Middle Valley where the guys are trying to rebuild that soil health. So that's what we mean by soil in good condition. It's a soil that's healthy, and we use a bit of a checklist when we're checking the condition of a vehicle which is an asset in the business. We might look at body condition, number of wheels, gearbox, oil leaks, et cetera. And it's the same for soils. We can do a bit of a checklist to see whether that soil is in working order. And the reason that aluminium is an issue is it's one of those key aspects of your soil, just like wheels on a vehicle or a gearbox on a vehicle. The amount of exchangeable aluminium is one of those key aspects in your soil's health. And if you have too much of it, your soil won't function well. And this is a picture from the Strathbogey aluminium and pasture variety trials, as we'll explore a little bit through the webinar. So if I have too much aluminium, plants won't thrive, you won't be making money, you have what we call a soil health issue. And that's why aluminium can be a problem. It's a soil health issue, it stops the soil functioning well. The key thing, I guess, to remember, so to just go back quickly, is that there's no point trying to fix that problem with a fertilizer because it won't solve it. If I've got wheels missing on the vehicle, putting more fuel in the tank is not going to get me to town. I have to fix the wheels and then I can put fuel in the tank. And that's the same with any soil health issue such as aluminium. I've got to address the soil constraint before worrying about putting fuel in the tank or fertilizer nutrients. And so today is really about addressing a soil health issue. And unless you address it, fertilizers and nutrient management are always going to be problematic. All right, so that's why it's a problem. 
Uh, and now let's look at where aluminium actually comes from. Why do some soils have it and some don't? Where is it? What's the, the history of it? So we're gonna jump in and explore that now. So this soil here that you can see is actually up in central New South Wales. It's on what's called the Liverpool Range. If anyone's ever been near the Hunter Valley and the Liverpool Plains, it's the mountain range between the two. And it's a very young soil. And you can see that the rocks in that soil are actually still in the topsoil. It's, it hasn't, the rocks haven't broken down. But basically, if we're thinking about elements in the soil, such as aluminium or calcium or magnesium, those elements originate in the rocks that form the soil. So most elements, including aluminium, are stored in what we call the Earth's crust. Through a process called weathering, rocks break down into minerals. And you can see here in this young topsoil, the rocks are still breaking down into minerals. And most landscapes across Australia, the rocks are, have disappeared, they've all broken down, but as you guys know, there are areas where the rocks are still on the surface. So rocks break down to minerals, and these different minerals contain various levels of aluminium as part of their mineral composition. So aluminium is a natural mineral in the Earth's crust, and it's part of different minerals. And here's a granite-based soil up in northern New South Wales, which contains aluminium. And some of the soil minerals that contain aluminium include bauxite, gibbsite, and a range of other ones. But there's different mineral compounds that are formed from rocks and some of them tend to be high, they're aluminium based minerals. The different soils contain different minerals in what we call their mineral composition. And as they're formed from different rocks, and here's a paddock near Myrtleford, again, on a different geology, different mineral composition. So the way I'm kind of going to use an analogy today, so excuse me if you don't like football or excuse me if you go for a particular club that I put the boot into and it's not because I'm putting the boot into them for any other reason, but just to use an example, because uh, I'm actually a rugby league bloke. I'm from New South Wales originally. Now I live on the border at Albury. But just imagine it's soil minerals. Think of a pub and footy fans. And depending on the state and suburb you live in, the pub will have a different mix of footy fans in it. Some areas might have lots of Essendon fans, other areas lots of uh, Melbourne fans. So it's just gonna have a different mix depending on where you are and the type of pub. So it's the same with soils and their mineral composition. You get different blends in different places, different minerals in them. And that means that different soil types have different levels of aluminium. And that's the important thing. That soils have minerals have aluminium in them and depending on the blend of minerals in a soil, it'll have different levels of overall aluminium. So the key thing is most of the time that aluminium is what we call inert. It's locked up in the minerals. It doesn't really move. It doesn't interact with the plant's soil life and the plants. Here's another, another paddock shot from that Strathbrogy trial. So if the aluminium lies dormant, it doesn't sort of muck around uh, and it's not gonna do anything. So all soils on earth have aluminium in them. So it's not just a few, all of them, some more than others. And mostly this aluminium is inactive. And we, what we call that is the total aluminium, the total aluminium. So what I'm gonna do now just briefly is just show you uh, some different soils. Uh, and you can have a look for yourself, the total aluminium in those soils. So if you have a look at this slide, I've just switched screens. You can see I've put up there, it's actually nine different soils from across Eastern Australia. And you can see here, I'm just getting my annotation button going. You can see I've got this first soil, which is actually near Brisbane. It's a cropping soil west of Brisbane on volcanic country. And I've got a Victorian soil over here in Northeast Vic on a floodplain uh, near Myrtleford. And I've got a tropical soil in North Queensland and a red soil growing sugar cane. So I've got a whole range of different soils. And what we've asked the lab to do in these soils is measure the total nutrient level, not what's available, but the total level. And as you can see, if we look down here, the, the lab has analyzed the total aluminium. And so you can see in the first soil, the basalt based soil near Toowoomba or Brisbane, there's 21,000 parts per million total aluminium. Over here on this red soil, um, in North Queensland, and there's similar red soils in New South Wales and Victoria as well, and, and other places. 
Now, the potato growing country, those of you who know that country, is 104,000 parts per million total aluminium. And you can see here, there's 18,000 in that soil there in Northeast Victoria, and the vanilla paddock up in far North Queensland is 37,000 parts per million. So you can see, the point I'm trying to make with that is that you can see that all soil types have aluminium, some have more than others. And that's the key, uh, the key point to remember. And what we've done with this test, just to show you one more quickly, this is a EAL test. Um, I'm gonna show you tests from different labs during the session. But what we asked the lab to do is not just the normal agronomic things like you can see on that front page, but we asked the lab to do the total test for this uh, client. And you can see the lab has done the totals as an extra test and they've measured the total aluminium. You can see in these soils, the total aluminium is 2,177, et cetera. So you can get a test that gives you your total aluminium. Uh, you don't always have to do it, but it is something that uh, you're able to do to measure what we call this total aluminium. All right, let's keep going. So I guess most of the time in most soils, the total aluminium doesn't cause any problems. That's the key message. It doesn't cause any problems. So now the question we have for some soils is how does the aluminium get exchangeable? Or another way to put it is why in some soils does it get active and become a problem? How come in some soils it gets active and starts to muck around, so to speak? So let's have a look at that. To, to answer that, we're going to have to go back a step again, just so we can get the context of exchange of aluminium, how wide gets exchanging. So to look at soil formation briefly again, as your soils keep weathering or breaking down, as the minerals keep weathering and breaking down through time, a few really important things happen. So a, re a few really important things start to happen. The first thing is that over time, some of the soil minerals transform into what we call different particles or particle sizes. So some of these rocks break down to minerals, the minerals keep breaking down, and we end up with the three particle sizes of soil texture, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, sand, silt, and clay. Uh, and you can see here, this first one is the sand grain, the largest one that I'm looking at on the screen. And then we've got silt here, if you can follow me. And then the clay, you can just see the clay dot there that I'm just circling and highlighting at the moment with the uh, online laser. This is a carbon neutral la laser, by the way, so, you know, and it's safe too. There's no HMS issues pointing at people's eyes. Anyway, hopefully everyone's awake. I can't see anyone. So hopefully you're not all falling asleep on your toes by now. So we've got our sand, silt and clay. Okay. And so the ones we're worried about or that concern us for aluminium, and I'm getting there, um, just be patient hopefully, is the clay particles. So the thing about clay particles is they're really, really small, less than two micron. To put that in perspective, that's the size of a bacteria. You can see some photos of different clays close up here. They've got strange shapes to them, but they're really, really small. And when clays act as what we call colloids. So this term is one of the most important terms that I'm hoping to get across today, that your soil has these things called colloids. So the way I'm gonna explain a colloid is with this glass of milk. So the thing about milk, when you buy milk, the main ingredient you buy is actually water unless you're buying chocolate milk, in which case the main ingredient is probably sugar. It's not very good for you. But the reason that milk is white, or brown in this case, is because something is in suspension in the water. There's something floating in that water, which is keeping it white, and that's why milk's white, unless it's got flavoring. And in this case, the things that are staying in suspension are the fats. So the fats are there. So in milk, fats are behaving as what we call a colloid. And you can see from this diagram here that the little fat particles are staying in suspension. They're not settling out on the bottom and they're not sort of uh, flocculating or aggregating. Um, if we were to make cheese from milk, we'd whack it with a coagulant, which would break the colloid behavior and you'd start to get milk solids. But they're called colloids. So milk is white because fat is acting as a colloid. And the thing about colloids and clay, because clay is a colloid, is that they have very special properties. So 
one of the really important properties, and this is going to relate to exchangeable aluminium soon, is that colloids, whether this is a fat particle or a clay particle or a humus particle, it's also a colloid, is that they have a charge on them. They actually have an electric static charge on their surface. That's what makes colloids quite unique. And so clays in your soil are colloids. So is humus, by the way, but we won't cover that today. And these clays give your, the, your soil an electro, electrostatic charge because they're a colloid. So almost always in soils, it's important to remember, almost always in soils, this charge is negative. This charge is negative. So the way you measure this charge on a soil test is called the cation exchange capacity or CEC. So I'm pretty sure a fair few of you will have heard of that term or be comfortable with that term. So the CEC or cation exchange capacity measures the size of this colloid charge. So let's have a look at a couple of soils and explore that. So uh, again, here's uh, some soils from some of this. Uh, the guys have given a few soils um, for today, a few of the farmers. So thank you to Peter and David. Um, and this is a soil here from one of the landmark soil that we're dealing with to look at aluminium. And if I scroll down, I know it's not this looks like gobbly gook, gobbly gook, but at the bottom, right at the bottom, I'll just get my scribbler going, right at the bottom, you can see this thing here, effective cation exchange capacity, also called CEC. And you can see the size of the charge in that soil is 71. Hopefully everyone can see that down there. So I'll have a look at another soil uh, with you just quickly. Here's another paddock. Um, we'll just scroll down um, and have a look at that. And you can see this paddock here, I get a bit of a dark color. You can see this paddock here has an effective cation exchange capacity or CEC of 1.7, much smaller. The charge is much smaller. And if I go to one last thing quickly to show you a few more, you can see from my nine soils, that they all have a charge, which I've summarised at the bottom, the CEC. You can see that heavy black clay, which has got a lot of clay in it, a lot of colloids, has a charge of 45. And a very sandy, granity type soil uh, can have a much lower CEC. You can see that CECs vary depending on the clays, etc. So colloids charge, it's a really important aspect of your soil. Uh, and it's measured as this CEC. Okay, so just to sum things up at this point, just, just to pull it together before we really get into aluminium and acidity, is that as your soils weather, they form clays, and these clays give your soil a colloid which has this charge on it. And this will become really important when we talk about liming and how much lime to use. So understanding your CECs a bit in, uh, is critical. And again, I know we're covering a lot of ground, so if you it will be recorded so you can put me on loop on the TV and just watch it all day and that way you can catch up with things. So the second thing that happens as minerals break down, the first thing is you get a charge in your soil from the clay. The second thing is that as your soil's minerals keep weathering, new element, nutrients and elements get released. They get released from the minerals and they become active in the topsoil. So we call these things active nutrients. And if you think about them, they kind of hang out in different active zones of your soil. I like to think about them as buckets in the soil. So you can see here, I'll just get my little squiggly going. You can see here, uh, get the arrow going. You can see that from the minerals, nutrients are coming out from the minerals and they're getting active and they're, they're no longer stuck in the minerals. The plant roots are here, all the soil biology, the soil community is here. And there's kind of three active zones in the soil. And if we, if you, the three main ones are the soil solution, the soil organic matter, and the soil colloid. And that's the one we're going to talk about, that one that has this charge on it. But just think about them as the three buckets in your soil where active nutrients try to hang out. Um, oops, sorry, I'll just get that that keep going so the way to think about it thinking back to this pub and the footy fans again is that punters leave home and come to the pub so if you think about everyone living at home is being stuck in the minerals and when they come to the pub they're getting active so they're just entered the active part of the, the soil zone if you like 
And there's different places in the pub that people will hang out, as you know. They might be in the front bar, in the lounge, in the bistro, in the gaming room, and some people might be out the back in the beer garden. So there's kind of different zones or areas of the pub that people get active in, uh, but they've all come from their homes in the suburb, uh, which is kind of like the, the overall minerals where they, they started. And so these are the guys obviously hanging out in one part of the pub and getting pretty rowdy. Okay, so there's different terms we use for elements when they get active. Um, available, which is usually used to describe nutrients that are hanging out in the soil solution, in the soil water. And then soluble, that's another term often used for that bucket of nutrients. And then we've got this term exchangeable. And we usually use that term exchangeable element or exchangeable nutrient for nutrients that are hanging out on the colloid, on this CEC. Uh, and the key thing is that plants can access nutrients from all of those buckets. And without going into it today, because it's a little bit off topic, but they can also access nutrients straight from the minerals if they have a fungal hyphae, like a van fungi or mycorrhizal fungi helping them. So we know plants can get their nutrients from all four buckets. Um, but for today, we're really going to focus in on the colloid. They're all important these buckets but today an aluminium kind of lives there and that's what we're going to look at now okay so i'll keep going on that so let's just focus in on that colloid bucket so this is the we call this the exchangeable bucket in your soil and it's one of the active zones in your soil just like in the pub you've got you know the front bar the, the gaming room they're all different active zones so the colloid is a really important uh, part of this soil because as elements are released from the soil minerals, some of them hang out on this colloid zone, some of your elements hang out. And it, this, and the other thing to remember here, and don't forget as we're going through it, is the colloid zone has a negative charge, has a negative charge. So those elements that are hanging out on our colloid zone, on the colloid bucket, you can see them here, uh, we call those guys cations. That's the jargon. So you've probably come across that term if you've been dealing with your soils for a while and reading soil tests. So cations, all a cation is, is a positively charged element. And you can see we've got a few here hanging on the colloid, C, E, C. Uh, the main important ones are calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium, hydrogen, and of course our friend aluminium. But you can see that they're hanging out here on the colloid. Um, again, using the footy and the pub analogy, you might have Collingwood, Hawthorne, West Coast, Sydney, Carlton, and Bulldogs fans all hanging out in the pub in, or in the front bar. If we think about the colloid as being the front bar of the pub and the organic matter being the beer garden, well, they're all hanging out in different, uh, there's different gangs of the fans hanging out in the front bar. So uh, they're the cations. Um, and they've all come from the surrounding suburbs out of the minerals and they're now hanging out in that front bar. So when it comes to soil cations, there's four really important things to get your head around. There's four really critical things. Firstly, we call these cations exchangeable because although they're sitting on the colloid, as you can see, they're sort of hanging out on the colloid having come out of the minerals, they, are, they can be taken up by plants. So plants can access that potassium off that colloid or that calcium. So that's why we call them exchangeable. Plants can exchange them and get the nutrients. They also can exchange with the soil solution, the other bucket in the soil. So they're kind of stable yet active. If anyone's ever read any books by William Albrecht, Professor Albrecht, the American soil scientist, he calls uh, these things stable yet available. And that's the key message is that they're exchangeable. All right, so that's the first thing to sort of remember. Uh, the second thing to remember is that they, the cations on that CEC influence soil function. They actually influence your soil function as those of you with aluminium problems will know, but it's not only aluminium that influences soil function. So nutrient cycling, root health, soil biology, structure, these cations are different cations and depending on how many of them you've got, they can influence soil health and therefore plant growth. And that's where we're going obviously with this webinar. It's particularly looking at aluminium and acidity. 
but that's a second really important point. And the third really important point to remember is that there's two main types of cations in the colloid zone. There's two main types. There's what we call the non-acid cations, the non-acid guys, and you can see them here, calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium. And then there's the acid cations, which we call the acid cations. And you can see that that's aluminium and hydrogen. So just remember that on that colloid zone in your soil is two main types of cations. Again, think about the footy puff. You can think about Carlton, Sydney, West Coast and Geelong as being kind of like the non-acid cations. Um, and again, I come from rugby league background, so I, I know I don't really care which teams you want to put in that category. But they're kind of like the nutrient cations that you need, they're beneficial for the soil. Uh, and then we might say that Collingwood and Melbourne, because I know a lot of people in Victoria put the boot into those two clubs, they're the acid cations, right? Eh? So we've got Collingwood and Melbourne as the acid cations and the other guys as non-acid cations. And so finally, the final thing to remember about soil cations on your colloid, exchanging on your colloid, is that in different soil types, you get different proportions of these acid and non-acid cations. In different soil types, you'll get different proportions of them hanging out on the CC. And you can see here, this is this little diagram, there's different sort of proportions of calcium compared to hydrogen and potassium. Some soils will have more of one and less, and less of another and vice versa. So again, thinking about the pub and the footy fans, you'll get different proportions of different club fans in different pubs. So in one place in Melbourne, you might get 80% Carlton fans and 10% Essendon fans and 1% uh, Western GWS fans. And in a pub in Adelaide, you're gonna get a different mix again. So you're gonna get different ratios or proportions. And it's the proportional percentage that's really important when it comes to this. Like I can be in a small pub that's 90% Collingwood, fans having a bad time or I can be in a really big pub that's 20% Collingwood fans and having a good time because it's not too many of them around. So it's the proportion that's really important. So the, the final thing there is that as we move ahead from soil cations is that in some soil types and climates, in some soil types and climates, depending on the mineralogy, their climate and their management and your management of them, you can sometimes get a high proportion of hydrogen cations hanging out on the colloid zone, hanging out on the colloid zone. So this is a paddock in North Queensland with 60% aluminium. It's a tropical soil with high aluminium. So you can see that it's also got a lot of hydrogen. So there's a lot of acidity going on there. So another term we use when a soil has a fair amount of hydrogen cations exchanging in the colloid zone is we call it soil acidity. So that's all soil acidity is. That's me measuring some pHs there on a workshop. And you can see that soil acidity is actually just measuring the hydrogen that's exchanging on your colloids. So we usually measure hydrogen acidity by measuring the pH in the soil. That's how we usually measure it. But pH measures the hydrogen ions that are active. So again, coming back to our model here, you can see the colloid, or the, which has got the CC charge on it. And you can see when we've got acidity, what it means is you've got a lot of hydrogens hanging out in the colloid zone. And you can measure that on a soil test by just measuring pH, or you can measure the percentage hydrogen ions. So let's have a look at some soil tests just to explore that a little bit. So if we go to, uh, one of these soils here, you can see that on this soil here, uh, we've measured the pH and there's two different methods, but I'm just going to stick on calcium chloride today. You can see they've measured pH and the pH is 4.3. So that's another way of saying it's got a high proportion of hydrogen, which is an acid cation, hanging out in the colloid zone. It's just another way of saying it. So we measure it by pH. Uh, if we get another soil, we'll have a look at this first soil here. You can see this soil here also has a pH of 4.3. Another way of saying it's got a lot of acid cations, hydrogen cations hanging out in its topsoil. 
And I'll just show you those nine soils again. And if you have here, this is a summary of those nine soils that I showed you the totals on before, it's the same soils. And you can see that we've measured the pH. So the first soil has a pH of 6.7. We've also on these soils measured the, how much hydrogen they have, exchangeable hydrogen on the colloid zone. And you can see that flower paddock that I showed you before, the tropical flowers paddock, it's got nearly 20% hydrogen floating around on the colloid. Yeah. So we're looking at, um, just get my slide back. We're looking at soil acidity as being the amount of hydrogen mucking around in the soil colloid. And soil acidity is really important. Soil hydrogen acidity is really important because it influences what plants grow in an area. It also influences soil health because it, in, it, it interacts with nutrient cycling and soil biology. When your soil's too, when you have too much acidity, what we call the hydrogen cation acidity, you'll get some problems. Uh, whether big problems or little problems, you'll get problems. So we call it a soil constraint, basically. That's the name, the term we use. And here's another of the paddocks at Strathbogie that's under the trial work at the moment. Obviously, there's an issue there, and part of that issue is this soil acidity from the hydrogen. So in summary, if you think of hydrogen cations as being like your second least favourite team, to be politically correct, I'm getting into trouble, and I don't mean to upset Melbourne fans, but if you don't, if you like Melbourne, then just choose whatever your second least favourite team is and just think of that as the hydrogen cations in your soil colloid. Uh, and so getting too many of these guys in the pub may start to cause a problem. So if everyone's happy in the pub and all of a sudden a big group of Melbourne fans rock up and everyone else is getting a bit antsy, it's because there's a little bit too much hydrogen acidity came into the pub. You know, things are starting to get a bit uneasy here. Now imagine a pub where not only there's a fair few Melbourne fans starting to mingle, but you're getting all these Collingwood fans rock up too. Sorry, Collingwood fans, I'm just picking on you because I know everyone puts the boot into you in Victoria. But I don't really care because I follow rugby league. But imagine a pub with a bit of acidity in it from the hydrogen and all of a sudden you get Collingwood guys rock up and we're calling them the other acid cation, remember, that's aluminium. So now the pub's starting to really get a bit rowdy and the, all the other fans are starting to get a bit upset. So in these pubs, you have double trouble, not just the hydrogen cations are causing problems. Now the aluminium cations have come out to play as well. And this is now the key issue with exchangeable aluminium. So this is the reason why we call aluminium an exchangeable or an acid cation. This is why we call it an acid cation. It's because in some soil types, as they get acidic, as you can see here on the colloid, the hydrogen's coming out from the minerals and hanging around in the active zone, and that hydrogen is acidity. In some soil types, as they get acidic, aluminium comes out of the minerals and starts to hang around on the colloid too. So aluminium's come out of the minerals. Remember, all salts have different levels of aluminium, and they're getting active. And it, it's, it's because as the soil acidifies with hydrogen, that aluminium is dissolved out of the minerals. So it often occurs at around 4.8, but not always. So you've got to read your soil test and watch your paddock results. But as the soil goes down to that level of acidity, that's in calcium chloride, at this point, aluminium starts jumping out of the minerals, getting active, and it's what we call exchangeable because it's hanging on the colloid, and we measure it as a percentage. So let's have a look at a few soil tests and have a look at this percentage aluminium on the soil. So I'll just grab a couple up. I've got a few new ones to show you. So this is a very different paddock from you guys. This is a sugarcane paddock in North Queensland. I mentioned sugarcane to you at the beginning, just to show you something from a very different area that struggles with the same issues you have. You can see here this soil here. I'll just get my scrawly squiggly going. You can see here we've we've measured the aluminium, the jargon that we use is saturation. So if you see the word saturation next to aluminium, you know they're talking about that exchangeable aluminium on your colloid. So in this soil here, we know uh, we've got the percentage of aluminium that's on our soil is 
So in this sugarcane paddock near Cairns in North Queensland, there's 28% of the colloid has got aluminium active and exchanging. You can also see that the pH is quite low and remember the relationship between the two. When a soil gets acidic, pH from hydrogen, too much hydrogen, in some times aluminium will come out to play. And the final number to look at, of course, in the whole story when we're talking about managing it later, is that the size of the charge, the overall size of the bucket, the, the colloid bucket is quite small. It's 3.56. So you can see here in the sugarcane paddock, it's got a small size bucket, charging colloid bucket, CEC bucket. On that bucket, it's nearly 30% aluminium and the pH is really low, which you'd expect. You'll never see the aluminium high if the pH is high because aluminium only comes out when hydrogen acidity jumps around. So that's an example for you on a uh, test from North Queensland, a nutrient advantage test. I do want to show you one other test, uh, which is a sweat test, because I know some people use sweat. So here's a test from sweat labs in Victoria. And you'll see on this test that they measure the uh, percentage aluminium. Where's it gone? Oh, they haven't, they haven't measured it because the pH is fairly benign but they have given the percentages of the other cations. So that calcium, magnesium, sodium, and potassium, those non-acid cations hanging out in the pub, they have given the percentage of those, you can see there, and they've said that, and they have given the hydrogen percentage. So they have measured the amount of active hydrogen on the colloid, that exchangeable hydrogen. They've said there's 51% hydrogen. So you can see, and as those of you that use sweat tests will know, they also give you a lovely pie chart uh, to make things nice for you. So that's an example for you of a different lab doing the same thing, just trying to measure the um, exchangeable, how much aluminium and hydrogen is mucking around on the soil's colloid. And I'll jump to one of the tests from the group here that, that we have for the day from some of the guys that are working on their aluminium at the moment. Here's a test. Uh, and you can see here on this test, the amount of exchangeable aluminium, there it is there, percentage saturation, that's the other term we use, extent for exchangeable aluminium. In this soil, it's 1.1%, it's quite low. And the size of the charge, you remember we looked at this before, is seven. So it's a, the size of that colloid bucket or the CC is seven, but, and on it there's only 1% aluminium. So there's not much acid cations around. And if we look up at the pH on this soil, we can see that even though there's not much aluminium around, it's still quite acid. The acidity is 4.3. So we'd say that there's a lot of hydrogen acidity but in fact, this soil type may not be that prone for aluminium to come out. As you can see, aluminium is still really low. So that's an example for you of a soil type that gets acidity, but doesn't get the second problem. It gets Melbourne fans in the pub, but Collingwood fans don't come along as well. Hopefully that makes sense. And my apologies to Collingwood and Melbourne fans. Um, I'm a rugby league player. Uh, so hopefully that gives you a bit of a feel for a measuring uh, salinity, uh, sorry, exchangeable aluminium, and that different soils have it. And when the aluminium starts to creep up, oh, I do apologise, there's the last soil that I wanted to show you guys. Uh, this soil here, which is another soil from Victoria in, that people are working on at the moment, you can see here that in this soil, with a pH of 4.3, so very similar pH to that other Victorian soil we just looked at, it has a pH of 4.3, and in this case, that, that hydrogen acidity is really causing problems because we have aluminium right up at 45%, exchangeable aluminium at 45%, so it's really high. So in that case, it's very different. That hydrogen acidity is causing us, is causing aluminium to come out as well. So that's where, that, in that soil, at the same pH, aluminium's flooding the colloid. All right, so hopefully that's given you a feel for how to read it on a soil test. Sorry, I took a little bit of time there, but it's, it's good to follow it through and have a look. So there's a few key things, and that's why I've got nice red highlights here. There's some really important things to remember around exchangeable aluminium. The first one is that an excessive proportion of exchangeable aluminium in your colloid 
disrupts soil function. It just throws the system out. It's like flooding the pub with Collingwood supports. The second thing it does is it compounds acidity. So if you've got some Melbourne supporters in the pub and you add Collingwood supporters, it's not just double the problem, it's quadruple the problem. So it, I won't go into the technical details of it, but when aluminium comes out and gets active and starts to play around on the colloid, it, it's not just like normal hydrogen acidity, it's, it's triple trouble basically. So it compounds his acid problem. And thirdly, this is also really important, aluminium, uh, someone's put in there to chat, it's like being an Aussie rules pub and a bunch of rugby, yeah, correct, Steve, 100% agree, mate. <laughs> rugby league, not rugby union, by the way, but yes, 100% agree. Um, and it's directly related to plant, it's toxic to plant growth, basically. So uh, it's not just compounding acidity and all those soil function things, but it's actually a toxic element. So it's a, it can be a major soil constraint. That's the bottom line. It's a big soil health issue and it can really be a soil constraint. Remembering that a soil constraint limits potential production as well as cost, increases costs usually. More, less efficiency of fertiliser, et cetera. So the second really important thing to remember is that exchangeable aluminium can only become an issue when soils get acidic. So you can't have exchangeable aluminium in a pH, so usually around, uh, around five-ish and above calcium chloride. But again, it does depend on soil, as you just saw, the different soils behave a bit differently. Uh, and it's the acidity that starts to release the aluminium and help it get active. Uh, and the third thing is that not all soil types release aluminium when they get acidic. And I just showed you two examples where the pH was 4.3. One of them had an aluminium of 1.1% exchangeable and the other, what was it, uh, 20 or 30 or something, 43 or something really high. So it only happens on some soil types depending on their mineral composition. And the, their, their particular mineral composition under certain climate, etc., makes them susceptible to the problem. So hopefully that makes sense. And uh, the other really important thing is that this problem can sometimes be found below the 0 to 10 centimetre layer. So just measuring 0 to 10 doesn't always pick it up. And I know that's an issue for some of the guys working uh, that I've got some soil tests from and that Karen's been working with, where you, you might grow, plant a pasture because the 0 to 10 says it's all right, there's no aluminium floating around but then the grass just falls over after half a year or a year. And it's because the roots have suddenly hit an aluminium zone. And I've seen it in broccoli in Queensland, when I used to love, live up in Queensland, uh, on broccoli roots just, just starting to get knotty and, and the roots getting not knobbly. So you sometimes need to test deeper down. And I have got an example for you, so if I can get myself organised. So this soil here, this first one, which we actually looked at from Peter Rigetti. So hopefully Peter's on there. I haven't get to yet, Peter, but hopefully I can catch up with you sometime. So Peter, this is a 0 to 10 topsoil. Um, this is Gauls West Above Dam, so Peter will know where that is. And you can see here in this soil, the exchangeable aluminium 0 to 10 is 1.1%. This is the one we looked at before, even though the pH is pretty ordinary at 4.3. Uh, but over here, we've got the <coughs> subsoil. So this is 10 to 20 centimetres. You can see that at 10 to 20 centimetres, we've got 33% aluminium. So I'm just trying to line that up. You've got 33% aluminium. So big jump from 10 to 20 centimetres. So that's an example for you of where it can get much worse at depth. And that depth can still be really relevant for growing. Um, so... If you have got your soil tests, what I'm going to do now, just for the next few minutes before we pull up and, and I'll hand over to David, is you can the key things for assessing soil aluminium, which you kind of hopefully starting to get a feel from, is you look for your exchangeable aluminium on your soil test, which we've just done. So I'll just grab one of them so we can practice. So that first thing you do is you look for the exchangeable aluminium level. That's the first thing you do um, and find it. Now, there are other ways to do aluminium which I'll come back to that's that one there but we're not going to do that today from a time point of view but there are different methods to it um, and the second thing we want to do after we sorry I'll just jump the screens again the second thing we do after we find our results is we have to benchmark our results so we have to we get a number whether it's five percent ten percent fifty percent we have to benchmark that number so 
the key thing with soil testing, whether it be aluminium, organic matter, phosphorus, benchmarking is the tricky thing, as some of you will well know, because it's not black and white. Soils are not black and white, and numbers on soil tests don't give you the full picture. So with that in mind, we'll just do a simple example, but you can get benchmarks on the soil test. So again, if we have a look at our soil test that we've been looking at, uh, this is through the uh, landmark guys, and you can see here that at the top of the test, the lab or the computer program has kindly given you benchmarking ranges. And the way it's laid out on these tests, if you use the nutrient advantage slash landmark test, is they give you these colorful charts. So if we go down to our aluminium, you can see that they're giving uh, Peter the red, the red pen. So Peter, red means you either get your wallet out and spend money or you're losing money, potential, you're losing potential income from loss of production. So red means two things on the soil test. You've got to get your money out and spend money or you're losing potential income because your soil health's holding back productivity. So in this case, the alum if is too high and it's going to be a problem. Uh, to use it, to have a look at another soil uh, from a different lab, you can see here, oh no, I won't use that one, sorry. Just get that back there. Uh, we'll go to our sugarcane paddock that you guys are looking at. You can see here that this sugarcane paddock with an aluminium of 28%, it's a different result. It's not in the red. And the reason is that in sugarcane, and those I told you before, sugarcane's a tolerant crop, the benchmark before sugarcane starts to feel a bit funny in aluminium is 50%. So a lot of tropical plants, just because tropical soils get really acidic and, and or aluminium, they're quite adapted to it. Uh, there's definitely, but the cover crops don't like that. So the guys that are going regenerative, they're definitely trying to uh, keep their aluminium much lower than that for good cover crops, which is helping with soil health, which then helps with crop yield. So, um, but that's an example for you for cane. You can see here, we've found a benchmark from uh, the Nutrient Advantage Lab, and the guys are able to, to use that to benchmark. So that's one way to get your benchmarks. Another way to get a benchmark is from your agronomist or from AgVic data, you know, there's fact sheets, or from the local trial work like the Strathbrogie, the guys working on that community trial. Uh, soil references, and I'm gonna, gonna show you a few of those books in a minute. And from your own monitoring. So if you're doing regular tests and you know your soil type, well, you'll know at what point the aluminium starts to be a problem. You might have a lot of experience on your soil. So, you know, if you do regular tests and you're and keeping an eye on it, you'll know your local benchmarks. So there's different ways to do it. So if I just give a very broad benchmark, and I know this is very broad and general, but just so we've got a working example, you can see these guys in northern New South Wales near Armidale doing the same thing. They're just doing that checklist on soil health. And one of those things is exchangeable aluminium that they're looking at. The good news for them in that soil is that it's got a smiley face. There's no problems with it. But if you're less than five, then it's all good using this general benchmark. And I'll come to some specifics in a minute. And if you're between 16 and 15, 6 and 15 percent exchange value aluminium, it's marginal, probably impacting on things. And if it's over 15 percent, it's poor. But as you can see, different varieties of pasture like Coxfoot, and they might be tolerant of higher aluminium. In which case. 15% might be good for them. So it's all a bit relative, but you do need to carefully pick your target. So again, to finalise on targets and benchmarks, there's a few things that make it not black and white. The first thing is soil salinity will impact, will affect the impact of aluminium. So the higher the salinity often it causes, it compounds the problem. Some crops and pastures species are more tolerant of high aluminium and the Strathbogie trial is that's exactly what the trial was for, to test different pasture varieties and see which ones did well in high aluminium. So there'll be more info of that from Karen, or we can get you more info of that later. And uh, good organic matter, soil structure, soil biological health can moderate the effects of aluminium to some extent. It buffers the system, if you like, and just helps the system keep functioning, even when the chemistry is a little bit ordinary. So there's some of the things to be mindful of when setting and, and sort of benchmarking. Uh, last few slides, and then I'm gonna pull up and, and hand over to David for a bit of, and open it up a little bit. David can go through how he's managed his aluminium, is that when you're using that 
assessing that aluminium. So you've got your number on your soil test, you've benchmarked it against your benchmark and you're saying, if you're good, if you're below your, your threshold and you're good, get a smiley stamp. And one thing we do in our workshops on how to read soil tests is have it, and it might sound a bit weird, but go to the news agent and get a smiley stamp and a grumpy stamp and just stamp next to the numbers on your test that are okay and, and the numbers that are not. And it just helps you visually, the soil tests aren't usually that user friendly. It just helps you, or you can use highlighter pens like the, the fluoro pens, just to help you um, read the tests and that, use them a bit more efficiently. So put a smiley stamp when it's good. It means you don't have to worry, you can go fishing. Yep. <coughs> it's not impacting on yield or, or impacting on cost base. If you're just around your margin, if it's marginal, so if your benchmark's 15 and you're at sort of 14, then you go, okay, maybe it's economic, maybe it's not economic to change, maybe everything else is all right. Uh, and it's the marginal sort of result that's sometimes hard to know whether it's economic or not to fix the problem. Because you might have really good root systems and clover growing and the perennial pastures growing all right, in which case the aluminium's probably not causing a problem even though the soil test says it's marginal. And if you've got really poor results, like 40 or 50%, 30%, depending on what you're growing, then you've got a, you've got a sad face going on there. You've definitely got a soil health issue or what we call a soil constraint. So if you've got a soil constraint, you've got to think about what to do and that's where we'll ca catch to a minute. So there are other ways to assess soil salinity, uh, exchangeable aluminium, sorry, as I mentioned. And the, the main way, which I won't really cover, but I'll just highlight for you, is this thing called the potassium chloride extract method. So you will see some of the publications and some agronomists will use that instead of the exchangeable aluminium. They're just different ways to measure that active aluminium, basically. They're just different methods. So um, some, some people uh, like to use one method, other people another method. As long as you're benchmarking and you know what you're doing, um, then it doesn't yeah, can, you can take different approaches to it. Um, and so if your level is good, you've got to think about how do I maintain that exchangeable aluminium at that low level? What can I do to keep it down, to keep soil health, um, whatever it is for your enterprise? If it's marginal, then you've got to decide, do I need to just keep it as it is, not let it creep up, or do I need to improve it? Because it's an economic decision, obviously. And if it's poor, you have a major soil constraint and you've got to look at what you can spend money on or effort on to fix the problem. And as you guys all know, you can burn a lot of money on soil fast and not necessarily get a result. It's really easy to burn money on soil. And it's also really easy to lose potential production from soils if they're in poor condition. So you've got to really be clear what you're trying to achieve, what your target is, so you don't waste your money. And you can see here, here's some liming being done at the moment, just a few weeks ago, a month or so ago, near home here at Albury. Uh, and um, as you guys know, there's three reasons people lime. The first one is because it's tax time and they're trying to minimise tax. The second one is because their neighbour's doing it, so they should do it. And the third reason is because they've got an acidity problem and or an aluminium problem, and they're trying to fix the problem and get to their target. And hopefully this webinar is giving you a bit of motivation to use reason number three, because if you've got a tax problem, give me a call, I can help you out. Okay, so, um, and the reason I did that was just that message there that the pH, last couple of slides, the pH and aluminium are related. So when you increase your pH, like this liming will be doing, the aluminium locks back up and disappears. So often liming and dolomite's the best option. And just to summarise everything, when the Melbourne hydrogen fans are ejected from the pub, the Collingwood, the aluminium fans also go home straight away. And the bounces are your lime and your dolomite. So they'll clear up the problem for you. So there's a few other things to taking action. I'm going to hand over to David uh, right now. But things like maintaining soil health, crop diversity, carefully managing nitrogen, building humus, these are all going to help. So hopefully that's given you a few ideas. Uh, there's a few resources. There's a few books that Karen can get through to you. And just remember to look out in the paddock as well. The soil test doesn't tell all the story. If you've got any questions, keep them coming on chat. And thanks everyone for that. We'll open it up for discussion. Thanks, Karen. All right, thanks, David. Uh, really appreciate the explanation of aluminium uh, in your soils and how to read your soil test. So great explanations. I love those 
um, colloids and the chocolate milk and that's no great. <laughs> Welcome. So now we'll pass on to David Cook. David, can you come online please? And he will just talk briefly about his um, ex own experience, farm experiences in Pine Lodge. If you have any questions, can you post them <coughs> in that section and be mindful to put it on so it's all attendees can see your questions. Uh, Penny and I will uh, help uh, facilitate those questions after David Cook's finished his presentation. Thank you, David. Okay, thanks, Karen. Thanks, David. Um, yeah, look, I mean, David gave a pretty thorough overview there of, of what aluminium's causing in soils and what we can treat it with. I guess our, um, our history with aluminium goes back to when I first came home in, in the mid 90s. And we've got soils, we've got pretty heavy duplex soils. Uh, we've got all top soils of fine sand clay loams, which are good soils, but then uh, a lot of our um, B horizons are pretty heavy clays, which don't allow one roots to penetrate and two for water to, um, to uh, go through. So we can get pretty heavy water logging uh, on a lot of years, especially like years like this where we've had a pretty good start, but it's a bit on the wet side. And if we continue to get too much um, winter rainfall, we'll end up in a pretty severely water log situation, which obviously impacts our crop growth pretty significantly. Um, so our soil types are inherently um, acid. Uh, when I first came home, we had soils that were probably from 4.5 uh, through to the low fives in terms of pH um, uh, calcium chloride. Uh, so yeah, pretty acidic soils. Aluminium, I uh, have to go back to soil tests, but it would have ranged anywhere from probably mid, mid uh, oh yeah, five, six, through to mid, uh, mid teens, uh, 14, 15%. Uh, so obviously between the acidity, the aluminium and the water logging, we could have pretty severe impacts on crop growth. Uh, take out the, the water logging, we still had pretty sig significant effect on crop growth at times. So our main strategy back then was pretty well to bombard it with lime. Uh, we were putting two and a half tonne of lime on our paddocks plus two and a half tonne of gypsum because we had reasonably sodic soils. I mean, so reasonably sodic sort of five to probably five to 15 percent sodicity or probably even higher than that so we're putting two and a half ton of lime and two and a half ton of uh gypsum and that was making uh, pretty significant differences especially the gypsum we could see that pretty well straight away from paddocks that you'd walk uh, walk across in your boots uh, would get higher and higher as you walked um with the mud building up on them to the following years you know you'd hardly be picking up any mud at all um the the lime was obviously a longer term longer term investment uh, back then we were working on lime you know probably having an eight to ten year uh, life cycle before it would perhaps get back to where we started and gypsum anywhere from sort of three to five year investment or you know, return on the investment in terms of how long it would last for um, so we obviously we started that because prior to that we were running uh, we were running cropping uh, pasture and prime land production uh, a lot of sub clover and wheat, wheat and oats and some triticale were our main main crops. Um, when I came home, obviously, you know, when sons come home, they want to ramp things up a bit. Uh, we were looking at canola. That's when canola was sort of just starting to take off in the northeast, um, and we were looking at growing also loose, and we want to switch away from our dominant sub clover. Uh, pastures because same thing they were pretty exposed to to water logging and low crop growth or low pasture growth if we had uh, dry autumns which we you know inherently have dry autumns uh, here so we embarked on a program of sowing uh, canola and, and dry land lucerne uh, we also were putting uh, lucerne onto our irrigated irrigated uh, ground for hay cutting predominantly and also grazing over the winter. So we were looking at crops then that you know, had pretty low tolerance of aluminium, uh, you know, well below 5%. And so unless we were going to put um, a lime on, we really weren't going to get particularly good results with the two of them. So pretty well um, the year or two after uh, putting the lime on, actually probably on a year after putting the lime on, where we started sowing both those crops. Um, you know, very hard to quantify what effect the lime was having on crop growth, but uh, our point of view was 
pretty well. If we didn't put it on, we weren't going to be able to sustain crop growth in either of those two. Uh, one of the traditional, uh, I guess, approaches to growing crops, if you weren't putting on lime, was to grow triticale because it's inherently got a higher uh, tolerance of acidity. Um, still, obviously, responds to to putting on lime like most things do, but you know you'd get uh, you wouldn't get the the um, loss of production compared to uh, to wheat and, and barley, which is more sensitive again than the wheat is. Um, so we were growing triticale there for a um, number of years. Uh, wheat and the canola um, stepped into favour beans in probably uh, the late 90s, I think, or well, probably early 2000s, perhaps 2001. Uh, same thing, favour beans don't like uh, light acid soils. They prefer the heavier uh, clay soils with high pH. So we were sort of fighting the fighting the um, the uh, the flow of the water against us by growing them. But we had been growing loop, uh, lupins, which are acid tolerant. Um, we were trying to diversify our, our legume uh, rotation or legume component of the rotation. So we started growing uh, faba beans. Didn't really see, you know, what I've said, any significant reduction in yield. Um, they've been way and above more profitable for us than lupins. I don't think we've grown lupins probably since about 2003. Um, so faba beans have become an important part of our rotation. They've got up to 25% of our rotation in the last sort of five years, not in the last couple of years, but prior to that, we were getting about 25% of our cropping rotation in lupins. So we're sort of growing, you know, three, 400 hectares of, of um, faba beans. Um, so they've obviously responded to to lime. And I think the other thing too with the um, with the liming is that inoculants on legumes don't like acidity. So any increase that we can get in in uh, soil pH is going to uh, vastly increase the um, the lifespan of the inoculant, which is obviously going to have pretty significant effect on um, uh, nodulation on our legumes, especially with with faba beans. Um, so look, that's probably a probably an overview of where we've been with lime. Um, we are still liming. We're putting on, uh, we're still putting on probably tonne and a half to two tonne, uh, not as often on on uh, paddocks now. We have do, done a little bit of variable rate lime where we've, we've we actually all our farms split into soil, soil zones. So we've got generally t um, three soil zones, uh, which have been EM surveyed. And so we can actually spread uh, we actually test, test all our soils to those zones, and that gives us the ability to to um, to vary rate our lime fertilizer, whatever we want to do across the farm. Um, we've actually just been over and pretty well soil tested the whole farm uh, back in uh, March, uh, just to see we hadn't had any soil tests probably for four years, four or five years, and I was just looking through the tests then, uh, and. All our soil tests now, we haven't come below 5.7 in um, pH calcium chloride, and we're just up over 6%, about 6.1, 6.2%. So to me, that's a pretty good indication that that strategy over the last 20 years um, has worked, that we've, you know, we've pretty well lifted uh, our um, pH you know, probably up to 1, 1.3%. And I think Dave will tell you um, that first 1% sort of out from the mid falls to the mid fives is the hardest from then on it only gets easier because it's a because um, it's an exponential um also logarithmic um scale uh yeah the first the, the first bit's always the hardest bit so once we get up over sort of high fives really there's there's not a probably great deal for us to push the lime bar anymore other than putting on uh putting on applications just to maintain our levels um and looking at the soil test too i was just flicking through them then uh, the highest um, aluminium percentage we've got now is 3%. Mm. And by the look of a lot of them would be under half a percent. So that's pretty well, um, that's tamed that, that aluminium uh, percentage for us. So really we don't now have any, any, any restrictions in crop growth on anything that we grow or anything that we might want to grow in the future. Mm. So that's probably about all I think you all need to say, Karen, unless there's any questions. That's great, David. Thanks very much. Um, and I see David's part of back with us. So Dave, can you take yourself off mute, please? I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, Pete Norwood has asked, can you please ask 
if aluminium can be blocked from the plant with an adequate supply of boron? Uh, okay, uh, Pete, that's a really big question. <laughs> I um, think any 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 questions from Pete Norwood should be blocked themselves. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty hard on Pete. Um, so I'm, I'm, I, I <laughs> don't want to I don't want to dodge it because um, but I just I can't do it justice in a couple of minutes. But uh, in the bottom line is I think one of the issues with high aluminium is lack of supply of calcium, and I think uh, that's probably Pete's sort of where he's going because we know that boron and calcium have a relationship. So 100% agree with that. But I think one of the fundamental problems when you have really high aluminium in the topsoil is that there's very low supply of calcium cations. So if boron, if we take that approach that boron can enable calcium supply, if I don't have calcium there to enable, then first thing I have to get is calcium in the system. And so uh, if that kind of gives you a bit of an answer indirectly in that boron, uh, it's, it's, we still need to add in the calcium, which is what liming does. And I probably didn't cover it enough in the webinar, but the other thing that we have is happening when we lime or dolomite is we're adding calcium cations. So we're getting those key cations in the system. Uh, but in the nutshell, I'll just give you that short answer, but happy to, to take it further in the Q&A next week, because I could probably do it more justice. Thanks, David. Another question from Ben Beck. We often get soil test results with low aluminium, but when we sap or tissue test, the results are often off the chart. There's no doubt this is impacting on plant health. What are your thoughts on the significant difference between soil and sap results? Uh, is that uh, is that aluminium levels in the plant tissue? Is that what that question is? That's not. So um, the al there's quite high aluminium in the tissue. He, of the he talks talks about low aluminium in the soil. So I'm assuming in the it's soil. Yeah, I'm and then it's, it's high, yeah. In the sap. Yeah. So if the if um, uh, hopefully I'm getting this right, but if the soil has low exchangeable aluminium, but you've got high aluminium in the plant tissue. It's definitely something I'm not haven't come across before. Certainly, uh, I know I've been in a tea plantation in Malaysia that had 80% exchangeable aluminium, and when I saw the soil test, I said, "Oh, nothing's growing there," and we locked up, and it's a tea plantation. So some plants can mitigate aluminium. They have ways to manage it, high toxic levels. A lot of tropical plants can actually deal with it. But yeah, that's a new one for me. But again, happy to see that test and just maybe look at it further without seeing the tissue test and getting a bit more context would be a little bit hard. If Ben's still online, maybe you can forward through your cell test and the SAP test. We can have a look at that hmm. offline. Or next Wednesday or whatever. Next yep. Wednesday, yep. Yeah. Uh, another question, this is for David Cook. Uh, it's from Peter Rigetti. Uh, spreading lime, do you put it out with cultivation or just throw it out? Uh, we used to when we first started, um, but we probably haven't done that for, probably only did that for the first application, which would have been back in the mid nineties and everything since then has just been, been out and direct drilled over the top of it. Um, I know there's this, this contentious issue of whether we do need to get it into the, into the soil. Cause obviously it, it, it works on, cause, um, it works on being mixed, um, or, you know, close to the colloids. To, uh, to attack that aluminium. But I think, uh, I think we're finding that if, if we've had that first, first, um, um, first application of lime, um, even that's not as immediately available uh, through spreading and just direct drilling, over time we're getting that, that, um, that lime moved down in the profile, um, basically acting as, a, I suppose, a slow release of the lime. It's not, it doesn't give us that big hit um, but having said that, you know, we did two tonne a hectare over most of our whole field over, over a whole farm three years ago. And you can see by those soil tests for now, you know, we've got them all up in the high fives. They certainly weren't there before we did that last application. So it's obviously having the effect of, of gradually getting down. Because uh, if you've got good, um, good soil structure and good root structure, though that lime particles are going to find their way down through those channels uh, and earthworm channels. Um, over a period of time as they just get they get washed in and moved in. I think that's a really important point, David. Sorry to jump in, but we see that in cane too, where the guys have a really big ding dong about surface spreading and turning turning in the line. But the guys that have good soil structure, 
you can spread it because it will incorporate through the pores and the porosity of the soil. Yeah. So I think that's a key and, point. And we, yeah, and we, and we figured that there's even if it might take longer, there's more, more detrimental effect on the soil structure by cultivating it is by you know, perhaps losing some of the efficiency up front with the lime. We will get it over time, but we won't get it up front. Thank you, guys. Uh, I did attend a soil carbon workshop uh, recently, and the soil scientist there said that incorporating carbon will get you a better result. So, yeah, your carbon, but that was her her opinion. So, um, yep. And I've uh, got another question. Oh, Peter um, Norwood said thanks, David Hardwick. Um, Steve Slap, has anyone had experience with soluble calcium and biology to punch through toxic compaction layers? Well, like we, to go first? We, <laughs> tried it. <laughs> we, we tried it last year by mixing um, uh, a um, gypsum prill with our guano um, and then drilling it, putting it down the tube for that, for that, um, for that reason, having attended one of Nicole Masters's, Nicole Masters' um, workshops last year, and I thought that's a pretty good approach because we have got you know, reasonable compaction in our soils um, and would have loved to have done it and kept doing it. But the gypsum prill was, um, was breaking up and basically forming talcum powder. And so we have to abandon it and just sow the guano. Um, so yeah, that was uh, that was pretty disappointing because I saw it as a way that we could get, you know, we could get higher rates of calcium into that seed row, um, yeah, without having to spread a heap of gypsum, which we still do. We're probably putting on a ton, a ton of hectare of gypsum now, but I thought we could use that approach as well to sort of try and target it into the drill row, but unfortunately, it didn't work. Okay, David Hardwick, have you got something to add to that? Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, I have seen uh, canola punch through an aluminium layer, but it had enough, there was enough good topsoil or balanced topsoil above it so that it could build a root system. So it had enough energy to sort of push through a thin layer of aluminium, if that makes sense. So it could get through that aluminium layer and into the non-aluminium soil below that. So that's, um, so I guess, Steve, what you're trying to do is kind of just moderate, modify the environment around the, the root system just while it's going through that layer. And one of the key questions I always think about is how deep is that layer? How thick is it? Because if it's really thick and you're just giving the, the root system a little bit of a biological blanket or whatever you want to call it, uh, then, you know, have you got enough, are you giving it enough support to get it, to, to get it through that, that layer? Or if that layer is really thick, um, you might help it for a little while, but then it starts to really encounter that pretty toxic sort of soil environment down there. Um, but certainly back in the 2000s, when I used to do biological agronomy in the Central West, we would often put calcium and biology down the boot because we, we came to the conclusion that was the most economic way to try and moderate that young root system environment. Um, but yeah, it, it does depend a bit on the thickness of it and the chemistry of it and you know what else is going on. Have you got good soil structure above it or how, how far along the soil health pathways, the paddock, things like that. Definitely worth trialling though, I think as David's pointed out. There's always issues with the products too, like powdering up, locking up tubes and all that. So yeah, trialling. Good idea, trials are a very good idea yeah. to do on farms before you do any major expenditure. You don't want to put $10,000 worth of, on, of product onto a farm that doesn't work what you want it to do to achieve. Well, uh, David. Problem, you can. Yeah, <laughs> we've got other solutions for that though, haven't we? David Cook, <laughs> soil tests below 10 centimetres um, and are, uh, I'm not sure what that is, it's, it's, uh, H HOS, aluminium levels, they're a problem. Maybe David Rigetti, uh, could you reach out that question maybe? David Cook, soil tests <laughs> below 10 centimetres. Basically, but did you do any soil tests below 10 centimetres, David? Uh, we've done, we, we have in the past, but in the context of doing deep end uh, testing. And we've probably done those over a period of 15 plus years. Um, 
And so that gives us nitrate ammonium levels, uh, pH levels, and years we've done sulfur levels too to see what the sulfur levels. Um, and when I said we've got duplex soils, they, they range anywhere from um, subsoils of sort of having five and a half through to uh, probably seven and a half and eight. Um, so we've actually got some alkaline subsoils there. Um, and like I said before, those subsoils are pretty hard to penetrate. So even <laughs> sometimes even if we can get the, the shallow uh, roots through and into those uh, heavy subsoils, very hard to penetrate if we've got, uh, if they're dry. Um, having said that too, they're very hard to penetrate when they're wet. Um, but yeah, we've never done full, we've never done full um, soil test down to that depth, uh, but we do have the pH and, and uh, ammonium level, nitrogen levels to give us a bit of an idea what they're like. But yeah, it's just interesting to see how much variation we had in um, pH in our subsoils. Mm. But most of your soil tests are in the first 10 centimetres. No, uh, we do naught to fifteen. Not to fifteen. So, yeah, to, to get a standard that sort of crop crop growth, or you know, that early crop growth stage. Yeah. And after that, they're on their own. <laughs> Very good. Um, okay. Is there any other chat questions anybody would like to bring to the table? I can't see any new questions there at the moment. Just a reminder that we are recording today's session, and it will be available via Vic No Till and the Golden Broken CMA website so watch this space um, we are going to if people if there's enough people interested we're going to run a separate session on next Wednesday the 10th of June at 1 p.m. if you're interested in being part of that just Q&A session uh, put yes in the chat box and Penny will send out a, uh, a re meeting request um, and we'll all log on together. Bring along your soil test uh, results and we can talk through them individually if we need to. And yeah, there's no other questions I have. There's a few yeses. So we've got about five or six people interested so far, David Hardwick, for a session next week. So we'll go ahead with that, I think. Um, there's a few more going through now. So Penny, if you could set that up for us, that'd be wonderful. Um, on that note, I think uh, there's more chat questions coming through. So thanks, David Hardwick and David Cook for presenting and helping uh, sort of spread, share the light, open up, whatever it is, the aluminium uh, story uh, in our soils. No, I, hope I didn't get into trouble with the footy analogy, but anyway. <laughs> oh, it didn't bother me. <laughs> um, uh, but I would like to thank you both for spending the time today with us and sharing your stories and your information. Um, I think our chat session next week will be very valuable uh, for those people that have got specific questions. And uh, Greg Ferry has put through saying, thanks for a great session, appreciate it. Um, I've also got, and Peter Aguetti said, yes, you'd answered his question, David Cook, about the aluminium. Uh, he's, uh, yes, our lower levels are very high aluminium, so that it is uh, having a major impact on getting permanent pasture established. And I know Peter has got a particular issue on a couple of his paddocks. He's tried to plant pastures and just, I guess, won't sustain. So, all right, on that note, I'm going to thank uh, Penny from Big No Till, David Cook from Big No Till and board member and farmer, and David Hardwick uh, for That's helping out, attending and participating today. Uh, we will see you, some of you, next Wednesday, and uh, we'll say goodbye. Thanks, everybody. See you, everyone. Thank you.